trying to get better at doing introductions rather than just, but here's the floor. So Colin Lee is our speaker tonight. And I, and I prepared a little introduction, did a little bit of research on Colin. Uh -oh. uh, according to his, web, his website, colinmashots.com, uh, and I had to read between the lines here a little bit, Colin was able to install WordPress in 2016. <laughs> to the end. I'm just kidding. So, Colin's one of these developers that has been around town forever. Uh, he's one of these people who, you know, you, you meet and you talk, at least me, that I meet and I talk to and I find myself nodding and saying, uh-huh, yeah, uh, a lot, because he's really into and has started working with kind of some cutting edge, really cool technology. Um, so it's, that's, um, that he's really familiar with that I only know a fraction of. He began programming on a uh, Radio Shack TRS-80 Model 1 uh, at the age of six, so has decades of programming experience. First met, I first met Colin, Colin as uh, he was proud to say the 10th employee of uh, When I Work, uh, which has now grown to be uh, much more than just 10 employees around town. He's worked at Pearson, worked at uh, Vidku, as, a, as an Android developer, and now, as far as I know, is the only Android developer at Amazon.com. Because <laughs> I haven't met any others, but that's, uh, I'm going to leave it there. So Colin is, as well as being a multi-talented, incredible individual, is going to talk to us tonight about Colin. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, hey guys, uh, I'm Colin, the Kotlin group organizer. Uh, I normally don't try to uh, do my own speeches at my meetup because that usually means I run out of topics, but in this case it's totally different. Um, I actually planned Kotlin Night Minneapolis for this month and uh, things didn't quite come through the way I expected them to in time, so I put myself in as a speaker and just said, I'm not going to like try to arrange anything else this month, just uh, I'll do it myself. So. Uh, I'm talking about Kotlin coroutines, which are something amazing that you, um, it just kind of uh, came out recently. Um, in fact, they're considered experimental. Uh, I have to give credit where credit is due. I'm stealing from the best. Um, Roman uh, Elizaroff, uh, or Elizaroff, however you pronounce it, is the creator of coroutines, and he also gave a great talk at uh, Kotlin Cup. So I stole most of my slides just because I didn't have a lot of time but I'm going to embellish and talk about these things uh, as well. Um, so let's get async. Let's talk a little bit about Kotlin coroutines. So here's an example where we're requesting a token from a server. Um, you should look at the comments and replace those in your mind with code that will say, uh, you know, go do this and bring it back. This is kind of just to give you an example of what the synchronous code might look like, sort of, in terms of signature. Um, and this is how you might say create a post. You have to usually pass in a token and an item, and you get a post back from the server. And here we're uh, processing the post. Just to, so then we end up with a uh, here's a function we create to then post the item. Um, you know, making calls to each of these three things in order. This is very easy to read when it's synchronous because we don't have these callbacks and scary things that um, will crop up crop up very soon. Um, it, so far, the code is very easy to read and easy to understand. Um, there, there are some, what we normally would do to, to bring this into an asynchronous world is to add threads. But threads have some problems. You know, when, when we only have 100 threads, everything works great, our, our program rocks, and we're happy. Um, as we increase that, we start to sweat a bit, uh, we're crying. And by the time we're at 100,000 threads, our pro program has fallen over. Um, one problem with threads is they're very, very heavyweight, and if you overdo them, you uh, pay the penalty. Um, so callbacks. Uh, callbacks save the day, sort of. Sort of. Um, here's a, this is what our code looks like before we put callbacks in, and here's the version after. Um, if you're not familiar with Kotlin, that uh, stuff between the parentheses there is a uh, signature, function signature for a lambda. So what we're doing is we're passing a function into a function. Uh, to act as our callback. So we need CV for callback. Um, and then when we make our request for a token, we can then invoke a callback after we finish. And then the thing about the callback is it returns immediately. Um, here's the callback version for creating a post. Uh, 
Um, actually, that was wrong. Oh, well. Oh, yeah, that's the before, this is the after. Uh, so in the async version, now we're passing callback in addition to the token and item. Um, so it's getting a little bit wordy, but it's nothing too bad here. Um, and here's our version four and after. So uh, in this code, what you can see is this is scrolling quickly from the left to the right and then all the way back down. Uh, we call this callback hell. And you've probably all seen this in, in code, if you, especially if you write JavaScript. Um, but that's not in any way specific to any language. It's just uh, callbacks tend to do this. And it actually gets a lot worse than the example up here. This is actually just a greatly, greatly simplified version of what the real production code would look like. Because nowhere here are we actually handling any exceptions. This code is just uh, taking the happy path and, and assuming that things won't break. Um, once you handle exceptions, you get even more callback hell. So, uh, we can look at uh, futures, promises, or reactive programming, Rx, uh, as another possibility to solve our asynchronous programming woes. So, here is our callback version of requesting a token. And here is the futures or promises version. They all look very similar, I guess, uh, when Roman took the slide, he used a promise, but uh, it could be the same thing with the um, completable future. Um, so here is before and then after. So this, this one, again, it's returning a promise, but it only takes the same items it would if it were a synchronous API. And finally, this is the before when we had our callback hell. Now this is a lot more readable. Uh, this is a lot similar to the kind of code you might see with Rx Java where you have the functional stream so you can just uh, compose callbacks after, one after the other on a chain. Um, it's very readable, and here's the great thing is that because this can propagate exceptions, this code is very, very close to the code you might actually write. Um, it's not just simple to make an example on a slide. Um, yeah. But you get some problems with uh, learning all the different combinators and, and tricks uh, when it comes to these uh, futures APIs. And there, there are many, many, many different Rx promises, features, APIs for different languages. So uh, let's take a look at uh, Kotlin coroutines. How, how would this code look if we were to rewrite it in coroutines? So um, here's our future code again with the promise to press a token. And this is what it looks like after <coughs> coroutines. You'll notice we now have a new uh, keyword in the language called suspend. Uh, it's very important. And we're just returning the plain old token. We're not doing any fancy, like, uh, promise to return that we're returning. We're just returning the bear types. Uh, here's before again. This is the promise. And here is returning a post. Again, we're returning a post. We're not returning a future of post. So this looks just like the imperative code. Um, again, here's before and after. So here in this code, you'll notice looks an awful lot like the, um, the the version that was synchronous, the version where there was no asynchronous behavior going on at all. Um, and that's good because making it look exactly like the blocking code means it's easy to reason about. Um, we still notice we still have the suspend function of the function that's calling all of these things, and that's because when we use the suspend keyword, um, we we cannot call a suspend function um, from outside of a coroutine context. So, uh, oh yeah, looks exactly like the blocking code. And one thing you can't see here, I'll show you a little bit later, is that the suspension points where um, they actually go asynchronous um, are, if you're using an IDE, if you'll look in your left gutter off the edge of the, uh, the, the code page, and you'll see a little arrow pointing at each line that actually suspend this execution and would then go to asynchronous at that point, which is super not handy. So you can do some pretty crazy stuff because uh, coroutines take care of um, going asynchronous while looking synchronous. Um, here's an example where you can just do for in a list and that create post a, a call can actually be going out to a server to create the post, returning back. And it does a procedural loop, will just work. Um, again, here's a, let's say you want to, I mean, the great thing about this is 
it's going to automatically take care of all the blocking you need to wait for each post to arrive back. Right? Um, simple, so procedural exception handling, because of the fact that it's actually blocking um, to get results, it can handle try-catch. You, you don't want to do it this way, because there's better ways to do it in Kotlin idiomatically. But uh, if you wanted to, you could try-catch uh, your uh, callbacks, or yeah, your coroutines. Um, other things you can do, crazy stuff, like you can have higher order functions that you, where you pass a suspending function into a, another uh, function. Here we're, uh, you know, for each line in the file, we're reading it, and then we're just uh, creating a post with that line. So because we've got a lambda there, we can just go ahead and um, suspend with that lambda. Um, later on, we might talk about suspending lambdas. But yeah, you can you can go ahead and do the same sort of thing with for each let, apply, repeat, filter, map, use, lots and lots of operators. They all work because again, the code you have here looks just like blocking code. Okay. So uh, suspending functions. Um, let's take a look at some of these. So here we have um, a typical retrofit call. Um, in retrofit, you don't write a class because the uh, comp compiler writes the class for you right, using the retrofit library. So this interface here gets turned into a complete um, uh, complete function that uh, has a body. Um, but here we're just declaring the signature. So if you look at it, it looks identical to your synchronous code signature, except that we're returning call of post. Well, in retrofit, which is a library for doing HTTP requests on Android or Java. Um, call is just the standard, um, <coughs> standard return value for anything that you want to return. Um, so we're not doing anything fancy there either. That's not like it's a deferred or anything crazy. Um, why would it be this simple? Um, because we're going asynchronous. Um, well, uh, here's why. So there's actually a, um, in retrofit, you can um, just wait using an await keyword, and it's actually using an extension function. Now, Kotlin has this ability in its language to extend any function with a static method. So I can say, look for every case where there's a call, and then um, you know add a, a new wait method that I can then declare that operates on the body of that call. And that's what they've done here: is you can actually just say uh, call my service dot create post dot await. And there, that, that line of code will suspend and it will uh, block until the result is ready for you to use it. So uh, that create post function will actually go out and um, create a post for you. So I'm what's right. actually going on there with that wait? Is it, is, is it like uh, calling that in a different thread? Is that the magic that Kotlin is doing? Or Yes. So okay. I'm, I'm going to get there, but yes. Yes, it's calling a different thread. Um, you're, you're going too far along the line without explaining what it is that you're explaining. Okay, all right, okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get there, but I'm, I'm working into it, okay. Um, a lot of these things are very similar between uh, several languages. If you've looked at C Sharp or uh, Python, uh, a lot of languages have this concept of async away. And Kotlin coroutines is very, very similar except for uh, a couple of small differences. And you'll notice a bunch of them. Uh, the spend keyword is one. We don't have an async keyword in Kotlin, but we do have an async builder, and we're going to get to that. Uh, but I just wanted to demonstrate here that this await thing will actually um, uh, block and wait on a, a worker thread. Uh, and that what, what's actually happening is these light coroutines, which I'll, I'll show you more about in a sec. These light coroutines are being farmed off to uh, a worker thread pool. Um, and then the result is coming back to these, this blocking thread. So uh, just showing another example. Here you can actually just test your retrofit call um, very, very simply. Um, all you have to do is you just wrap the calls in the run blocking, and suddenly everything just runs really, really nicely. Um, because that's all it takes to um, do things in uh, tests. There. Okay. So let's talk about composition a little bit. Um, 
uh, higher order functions. So I think this is very clear what this slide is talking about. Um, basically, the idea is you want to be able to retry your request. Um, so they, they create a retry I/O method here, and here's the actual implementation. Now, I want to show you is, and I don't know if everybody in here knows Kotlin uh, syntax yet, but that thing right there again is a lambda, uh, parentheses to t, it's referring to a function that returns t. And to the left of it is the word suspend. Um, what that's saying is that the variable named block refers to a suspending lambda. Um, so in this case, you can pass in a function uh, which will then go off to another thread at some point, and uh, when you call it here, um, and it will then um, execute that lambda on another thread. So the function itself has to suspend because otherwise it couldn't call the block. Um, and then here it's actually making the call. So what this is doing is it's actually delaying and retrying the request uh, until doubling the delay every time until it can reach at most 60,000 or so, 60 seconds. Um, so this is actually iterating while true. Every time it tries the block, catches an exception, logs the error, and then just keeps on going. There you go. That's, that's uh, retries written with Kotlin using higher order functions, in this case, a suspending lambda. And one interesting thing to note about suspending lambdas is that most of the um, coroutine library is actually written using suspending uh, lambdas. So if I showed you implementations of these things, they would look almost identical. So here we, uh, um, yeah, we start with the, the suspend function. Uh, I think this is just showing the fact that, uh, okay, these are the lines that you move. Those two lines are the lines that actually suspend. Um, you can't see the gutter in this case. We're not in the IDE, but uh, block here is a suspending lambda, so when we return the block, we're actually executing the lambda and returning the result value. Um, and then delay down there, delay is a built-in coroutine function. It's not thread delay or thread sleep. It's actually um, it's doing a, a built-in coroutine function to then um, wait on that worker thread. So there you go. So let's look at, so coroutine builders are how we create our coroutines. Um, obviously, we, we can't make every function in our app uh, have the word suspend in it, um, because if we did, you wouldn't actually be able to execute anything. You'd have to have some, something block at some point to make the code actually function. Uh, so let's see, this, here's our example. It has the word suspend on it to be able to call all those suspend functions. So what if we drop the suspend? Oops, here we go. And they do the, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, Die Hard uh, reference for uh, Christmas here. So, oh, 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 now I have machine error. Um, anyway, uh, I dropped the suspend. Uh, so now the compiler is telling me suspend function request token should be called only from a coroutine or another suspend function. Um, and it doesn't make it very easy to understand, I think, right there. but. Uh, what's, what's going on is we need to do something to be able to execute our suspending functions. So we need these things called coroutine builders. Um, one cannot simply invoke the suspending function. Um, so uh, here's one coroutine builder launch is this little block here. It says launch. This is a way to fire and forget a coroutine. Essentially, launch is saying uh, we just want to go off, run this work, and we don't care about the results. It's, it's very, very simple. It's the kind of thing you use in, in demo code on real production, I guess. But it's, it's, it's probably the most simple coroutine builder um, because you know I can just block around my code and suddenly it runs. Um, so yeah, the launch will return immediately and run into background thread pool. Um, in parentheses, you can specify what's called the coroutine context. So when I say launch UI, I'm actually saying I want to launch it onto a UI thread. So I think that's I think what Roman actually meant is different from the Android meaning of UI thread. I think he meant a, a UI worker thread, which is very different. Um, 
So the match behind launch, it's again, I, I wanted to show you this again. Suspending lambda right here. See the word block? So if you return the block with parentheses after that, it will actually execute the lambda and return the result. So here we have this thing called launch that will then take a curtain context like the word UI and the block, which is the block that we put after it, and then return us a job. Now the job is just there to so we can wait on it and you know until it's finished or it doesn't really return us any information about what executed. So it's not launch is not something you do when you want to uh, return a value from your um, from your work. Uh, but here we go. It's an example of actually waiting on that job. Uh, so the launch is now returning a job from its suspending lambda that executed. But down here we have the word job.join that will actually wait until all the child routines complete. So this one will obviously print hello world uh, because it's delaying the first, uh, delaying the word world until after hello. Question? Yeah. When we do a launch without a context, do they all get thrown into the same thread or does each one get its own thread? Uh, each one gets its own thread. There's a default context. I think that was even on the last slide. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. Yeah, default dispatcher. It, so um, Kotlin has both names parameters and it has default parameters. And the first one there is a default parameter. So you don't have to uh, put a context there if you don't want. It will use a default value. That much I understood. Is yeah. The question is whether it's one thread or multiple threads. I, I believe it's still going to be multiple threads. I think it's still a default thread for it. I just don't know much about the default dispatcher to answer that question. To say, you know, what um, specifically the default dispatcher is doing versus the UI context. So I don't have that answer, but uh, I do know that it, even if you just say launch on its own, it will go to a thread pool. Yeah. So uh, we're going to compare briefly to async await. Um, again, like, like C Sharp, Python, and several other languages all implement something very, very similar. So we're going to just do a quick comparison here. Um, there's a Kotlin example one more time. And here is how you do it in, in C Sharp, Python, TypeScript, Dart, and I guess soon JavaScript. Um, it's JavaScript now. Is it now JavaScript? I've been doing it all along. Or there you go. JavaScript is now supporting async await guys. Um, what you'll notice is Kotlin coroutines don't look that different really from async await, but there's an important syntax difference, and we're going to get to that soon. Um, first off, you have this async keyword over here, and then we have an await keyword. Um, there's no await keyword in Kotlin, um, and that's important. Um, let's see, move forward here. There you go. Um, so you mark it with async and you return a future. So you'll notice that, um, it, well, it shouldn't say, yeah, it should say that it's returning a future. Uh, I guess I didn't put it in the uh, code up top there. But the, it's actually returning a future. Um, and then the await keyword then would suspend in this case. So um, each of those is individually waiting until the value is ready to be used. Um, so why is there an await keyword in Kotlin? Uh, here's how C Sharp does it. So in C Sharp, you have a uh, you would use the request token call produce task with token as a return value. Um, but then the await will then return the token itself. So the wait is used when you have asynchronous behavior, and request token without a wait is used when you want synchronous behavior. But then we're, we're producing a task of token, which uh, seems a little backwards, because async should be harder than, than writing synchronous code. Um, was, apparently, that was the design reason why uh, Kotlin works differently than C Sharp in this sense. So they, they, he wanted this flip, he wanted the async version to be harder in the the synchronous behavior to be easier. So here uh, in Kotlin, by default, if you just say request token, it produces token. Um, you're going to have to call that inside a suspending function or some kind of coroutine context. But at least you get the synchronous behavior. Um, but if you're going to want to create an async block called request token, you can produce this thing called deferred of token, which is your future equivalent. It's the same thing as promise. Apparently, all the names are taken, uh, you know, promise, future, 
Um, I, I, I heard that Roman actually went into like a, a programming book to look up words having to do with futures, and the only one that wasn't taken was deferred, so they ended up with that one because uh, they don't want to conflict with Java's naming scheme. So um, they ended up with deferred token in this case. Because yes, Kotlin is very, very Java compatible, and the last thing they want to do is break Java. So uh, the Kotlin approach is designed to be concurrency when you need it, but uh, easy to use when you don't. Um, so you have these suspending functions, but they don't require you to use the async behavior. Um, they make it concurrency harder and concurrency explicit. Whereas uh, I think in traditional async way, concurrency doesn't have to be explicit. You can kind of um, hand wave around it a little bit. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, there's C Sharp's uh, version of getting an async image loader. Okay. Uh, again, this is returning task of image, which is like a future in this case. Um, and then you would uh, then just you know, call, get a promise from each of those, wait the promise, and then you can combine your images. That's what it would look like if you're writing the code in C Sharp. Cool? So in Kotlin, the same code, uh, we're going to load image async, return this thing called deferred of image. Again, that's just um, the name they chose, because it was what's available. Um, and then we're actually taking this async block. And again, it just load it, load it to deferred, and then await. We don't use a keyword; we use a um, you know operator on there on the deferred, and then uh, just combine the images. It's very simple because we don't have to deal with strange return types at all. Well, C sharp, depending on how you build your, you don't have strange return types either. Okay. Yeah, a lot of the code looks very, very similar, especially between like Python and Kotlin. It's it's not that far off, really. Um, I think they just wanted to you know, continue a pattern that a lot of programmers are used to, but they don't get in Java. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So using the async sync function would need it. Okay. So let's see. I'm trying to figure out what my point was with this slide. Okay. I'll keep going. Um, so here I have a spend function to load the image, and here is a function then to combine them. Um, I don't know what the point of this was, it looks just like the previous code. But, oh well. <laughs> These things happen, sorry, sorry. So what are coroutines basically? Now I'm, I'm backing up, you're finally answering your questions. Um, I mean coroutines are ultimately just like very lightweight threads. They kind of take care of um, the logic behind uh, reuse of threads for you so that you just um, can use them and throw them away and not worry about uh, whether they are um, still sticking around and consuming memory like they thread them. So, uh, Jake Morton actually said, and this is not a quote from one of his talks, he just said this in the NRS study group, so he probably didn't want me to use this quote, but whatever. Uh, no. He's called a compiler magic for callbacks on thread pools. So, um, the great thing is, it, it's there's nothing too crazy or magic about this. It all kind of makes sense in any language that you would do it in. Um, so a lot of people are asking, well, what about RxJava? We have this new tool in the toolbox. Uh, it, it sounds great, and amazing, and useful, and it, the code looks pretty good because it looks synchronous. Um, does my RxJava like knowledge still make sense? So. The answer to that is that it doesn't really replace RxJava. RxJava is its own thing, which solves a problem in a functional way. Uh, it's very relevant. And coroutines are just another tool to put in your box. Um, sometimes coroutines will be in infinitely useful to you because you don't know how to, how to write something, but once you put it in an asynchronous looking fashion, everything makes sense. Um, sometimes RxJava will have operators that make your life so easy, you would wonder why you would do anything any other way. Um, so I think RxJava remains useful, and I would not um, throw away my RxJava knowledge because I suddenly know uh, coroutines. Um, yeah. And because of the fact you're actually streaming the data in a functional stream, you're, as long as you're not saving things off to fields, you're pretty much guaranteed you'll get your thread safety out of it um, with RxJava. So it's good stuff. Uh, coroutines are useful. They're built into language. Uh, one great thing that you know, I didn't mention up here, but because they're built in, 
They're available on every single platform Kotlin is available on. That means if you're using the code generator for JVM, JavaScript, or LLVM, you're actually getting coroutines in all three of these. Um, you don't have to worry that your platform does not support the, uh, the code you want to write. So um, it, it's like if you write your code with coroutines, then you don't have to rewrite it to support uh, running your same code you used on your Android app on the web, or running it on your server, or running it on a, an iPhone, for that matter. Um, another good thing about them, obviously, we've noticed they're easy to read and to reason about, because once you have a suspend function, everything looks synchronous again. Now, they're very easy to cancel. I think, I'll, I, think I even gave an example here to look at pretty soon. And easy to write complex control flow. Um, obviously, you can do suspending lambdas and higher order functions and do all kinds of craziness. So, uh, Cancellation in coroutines is something that's cooperative. Um, that means that you have to kind of make it, you know, make, you have to have some understanding of when you've been canceled. It's not unlike the real threats in that sense. Um, so all built-in functions for coroutines automatically will cooperate to allow cancellation. So if you use a built-in function in your coroutine, at that point, if, if, if a cancel call has been made, it will monitor that call and cancel the coroutine. But if you don't have a built-in function at some point and you do want to be able to cancel right then, then you can always check the is um, active um, function on, inside that coroutine context. Um, you can either call that function, yeah, that's just what I said. So I, I guess I'm reading my slides, sorry guys. <laughs> Anybody have that experience where you like, you know, you, you know you don't want to read slides, but then you, you turn around and you're trying to remember what you were talking about when you wrote that thing? Um, yeah, quarantine. So one of the big questions at, at Kotlin Conf, which they emphatically answered very loudly, was why should I use coroutines if they're marked experimental in the language? Um, and that's an easy question to answer. Apparently, I don't know if Russian to English dictionary doesn't, doesn't get the word experimental across well enough, but they say it's ready for production. They say you should be using coroutines today uh, in your code because it's absolutely ready. What they meant when they put the word experimental in there was something entirely different. They, I want to be able to alter the API in minor ways from 1.1 to 1.2 to 1.3. And allegedly, uh, Kotlin 1.3 should be the final I implementation of coroutines. So if you use them today, they shouldn't change much, if they change at all. Um, so and they, they have promised that for any major version, so 1.2, if you don't upgrade to 1.3, your coroutines will all, all continue to work. So they're, going, they're making a very, very solid effort to make coroutines happen no matter what uh, you know, level you're in. It should be ready to use in your real code. So let's talk about some advanced features. Um, I mentioned coroutine builders. There's a lot of them. Um, so you've got, we saw launch, async, and uh, I think I didn't show you the weight. Uh, run blocking is interesting. That actually, um, it's kind of similar to launch. Um, produce an actor. There's, a ton of different builders that will all give you slightly different behaviors in case you want to return a different value to manage your coroutine. Uh, some of those, like Actor, are useful if you want to, say, uh, pass a lot of data between different threads in the thread pool, for example. Um, we also have this thing called Build Sequence, which will lazily create a sequence uh, as a synchronous coroutine. So Build Sequence, you can, is, I'll show you an example very soon. Um, basically, you can go through and it'll run this code on threads, generating values and waiting for each yield call. Um, and the code is blocking and waiting for yields to then generate results. So, this is a coroutine example. And there's also a ton of built in suspending functions in the, the platform. So, all of these are built into coroutines. You've got uh, delay, yield, run. With timeout, with timeout or null, join, await, send, receive, receiver, null, lock, and delay. I think I put delay twice. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. Um, the, 
but those, so the, it's not as powerful, I guess, yet as RxJava. I mean, that thing has so many operators that you could actually confuse anybody um, if they haven't yet uh, dug into it much. Um, but you know, at, at this point, I, I think of Coroutines as being a, a, a tool to build on things from. It's not a packaged framework or a solution the way that RxJava tries to be. And uh, as Jake Wharton said, um, coroutines shouldn't be described as replacing RxJava. They take the place of RxJava schedulers instead. It's more like the solve the problem of being the back end of a solution like RxJava. So we have lots of things still coming that are on the way that will make coroutines more powerful still once they write more libraries for them. Um, so most builders, yeah. So most of the stuff I just talked about is probably too much to give in an intro talk for coroutines. Um, so maybe I'll have to convince me to do that one later sometime, uh, once I've really dug in deep. Um, yeah, there's some cool divide and conquer stuff. He has a very, very lengthy uh, document explaining all the different crazy ways you can do um, massively parallel algorithms where you're sharing work uh, like you would in, say, an MPI application um, using coroutines. And here you, you've got all the things that you might do in Java um, with the completable future, is listable future. All those things can be done with uh, coroutine builders. So you can easily convert existing Java code over to coroutines um, just by uh, wrapping it with these uh, builders. So let's take a look at some code. Um, let's look at this guy first. Oh, it's not showing up on the screen. That's not good. Sorry, guys. Why is that not sharing? I'm pretty sure it's just the app when you can Yeah, it's just sharing the, the wrong build. I think it's sharing based on what um, you call that. Sharing the, uh, the desktop rather than sharing the, uh, um, the whole environment. So I'm trying to figure out. Sorry guys. That's frustrating. Okay, let me try this. I'm just close out a deck set. Let's see if that works. Now I got that. Okay. Sorry. I will. Because 
what's happening is it's actually um, it's launching the threads out of order, and it's um, you know not, not getting getting finished with every single thread by the time it prints the value at the end. So we're actually looking at a number that's not correct. Um, but at least you know launch did it actually launch a million separate uh, lightweight threads, which is cool. Um, okay, so here's an example where I do it safely. Oops. So, um, here I'll run this. Okay. Sure. So, we're going to run this code. So, this is actually returning a deferred. Because we're returning a deferred, which is a future, we can then uh, actually sum them up here with the deferred.sum by operator. And there's where I'm awaiting inside of that. And I just print the sum. So in this case, and I think I didn't even bother to use an atomic in this case, I just used uh, integers. Um, I believe that's the right value, but you know, we could definitely check that out, find out. Um, but here, I wanted to show you briefly on the left side, you see that in the gutter right there? That little thing is telling you that it's suspending on that line. So code is actually going off to the background thread or thread pool at that point right there and all million um, coroutines safely completed and add up their values. Um, I don't know if this one's especially interesting. Yeah. It's just another way of saying the same thing. I, I made a workload for it, but it's pretty much the same code. So we'll just ignore that and move on. Okay. Let's take a look at this. So here's an example of generate sequence. I just wanted to show you. Uh, I was having fun with uh, FizzBuzz, which is a uh, uh, spoiler alert, a commonly used interview question, which I'm not going to use, so don't worry. Um, commonly used interview question because a lot of people can't even do the basic uh, operations in FizzBuzz. So what FizzBuzz is is every you, you take numbers, let's say from one to hundred, and every number. You, know, you would go, you count two numbers, and every number which would divide by three, you say fizz, every number which divides by five is buzz, and every number which divides by three and five is fizz buzz in that order. So this code is basically running this generate sequence operator here um, with a seed of one, and then adding one to it. Uh, it's, it's running this lazily, which doesn't really matter because it's not much work. Um, and then it's just going to map the values with the one operator. Um, here, in FizzBuzz, you're supposed to return the number if it doesn't match any of those three. So, very, very simple code. When I run it, it's not going to be surprising, and it will run forever, because it's lazily, oh, it's still running the old example, excuse me. Yeah, FizzBuzz, there we go. Let's run the right code this time. There we go. It's running very, very quickly, so. Um, I could pause it and you could probably tell, verify if it's doing the right thing, but it looks pretty good anyway. All right, um, I've already validated that it's real. So just for fun, I, I did a version of this where it was like extensible with any number of stuff in the map and uh, used big integer, or big decimal, rather. Um, and the great thing about big decimal, obviously you can make numbers that are ridiculously large and keep going forever. Um, but well, some of the things you, I did here, which, which is fun, is you can actually create your own operators. Um, well, I mean, the, the built-in operators like plus can be over, overridden, but you can't override everything in the language because that would be stupid and you would end up with um, code that can't be read, and things like Acme, Bleach, and Perl. Um, but they, they do have operator overloading, and they, I was able to actually create an um, extension method here, dot big, to then just Turn my integers into big decimal, and uh, yeah, extension methods are amazing. Is what, what I'm saying here. Um, so this code will actually go through, generate big decimal, and run it against this <coughs> map, and generate uh, fizzbuzz backs with five, three, and seven inspectors. So now it's the extensible version. Not too surprising. Yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah, the great thing about current sequence is because it's lazy, it can be used really well. It's a synchronous coroutine and does 
and stuff. All right. Let's look at a better curve example. Here's how to do delay or delay. Here's how to cancel a job. So this one is going to run until 1,900 milliseconds, uh, delaying 500 milliseconds at a time. So it will. Uh, what's going to happen is when it, when it finishes um, its wait, it will actually cancel the curtain, and then job.join will tell it to um, then you know what. Job.join tells all the other threads, or lightweight threads in this case, to uh, bring in the results, we're done, um, so we can quit. So here, we would wait. As you can see, because it was waiting in 500 millisecond increments, it made it to 2,000. And it says, I have waited over 1,900 milliseconds, so I can quit. So here's my cancel, job that cancel. And I'm, we're done. So you can do the same thing with uh, any of those other things, like um, if you have async, uh, you can then, I think, leave cancel your deferred as well. All, all these things work great. Um, cancellation is easy, um, easier than in a lot of languages. Let's just take a look at a retrofit example. So yeah, don't look at my app ID. Um, what I'm doing here is I am using the weather API. Uh, I'll do, I'll just to show you, I'll, I'll show you what the weather API is. So um, go to API and weathermap.org, OK HTTP. I'll just put a logging interceptor in there, but I don't really need it. Um, using Moshi, and here's my query. Right? The rest of it down here is just models, nothing that's important. And most of it's not getting used. So um, here's the real code that we care about. So. The interesting thing here is that there's a function called await results. Um, somebody created their own library that contains extension functions. Surprise, surprise, you can create an extension function for any, um, any class uh, that anybody has created. So it doesn't have to be the person who wrote the retrofit library. Uh, you yourself can write your own functions on top of retrofit. And in this case, what's going on is the await result function is actually going to um, stop there, um, you know, block while it um, goes out to the server and comes back with what's called a result. Now, in retrofit, uh, result is actually a wrapper class that can contain either the, the value you're looking for or uh, some kind of an error. So it'll have all the information about your HTTP errors. Um, so I'm getting a forecast for Bloomington, Minnesota, I believe, um, Chicago. Maybe I should say that here, Bloomington, Minnesota, uh, Chicago, and then I'm going to, you know, convert it over to, um, yeah. Basically, in the API, uh, there's a main object which has the temperature inside it. We're going to get the temperatures. We're going to use absolute value and subtract and get the difference. And then I'm going to either print it or print the error right there. Uh, you'll notice. <coughs> On the left hand here, there's a suspend function called markers on the two places where we suspend. Right there and there. So here we go. Let's get our weather forecast. Ooh, can I reach the weather server? This was working earlier. Um, let's see. Did I do something wrong? Okay. Uh, let's take a look at the logging interceptor and see. Saying uh, local temp is 1978 degrees, well, it's 30 degrees in Chicago. So 10 degrees warmer. Um, I don't think it would make enough of a difference to make me want to move there. Uh, good to know. Anyway, so th this simple example is just demonstrating that uh, because of extension functions, you can very, very easily write your own libraries to uh, consume coroutines um, like, like I did here. And again, because I'm returning results here, I, I can handle the error any way I want. Um, there's lots of options. Yeah. So if I'm understanding this correctly, yeah. it gets the Bloomington forecast, and then once it has the result for that, then it goes out again and 
against the Chicago market. And I believe that's because running within one run blocking loop um, or, or braces. I believe that's the case, yes. Right. Because we, we made this thing basically synchronous. You could actually do, have it do both at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, to think about that one for a second here. But I, I, I'm pretty sure you could. It would be. That so, would be with the async block? Um, you could actually do run blocking on each of them, I think. Let's see. No, because. Uh, yeah, I think that would be an async block. Yeah. I'm trying to think here. So now it's going to return a deferred. The point here is I'm going to have to return something different from each of them. Yeah. So I'm going to have to do this. Code's going to get a little messy. For two, let's async. No, async will not work. There we go. And then I'm going to copy Chicago out of here. Let's do this. Yeah, I here. Sorry, this takes a second. So, one sec. Kind of forecasts. So, do all this stuff. I have to Let's see if I can pull this off. Uh, okay. Java implementation written entirely in coroutines. 
um, which is pretty cool to look at. Um, and I have the code somewhere here. I don't know what the name of the GitHub repo was, though. Uh, Reagent. That was it. I was just looking at it. Um, so let's look at this just for fun. So here is uh, our Java written in coroutines. Um, there's not much to look at here yet, but you can kind of start to see it. Um, let's see. Consumers, normal, Arch Java stuff. Are you just passing a coroutine context and you're getting a receive channel? So channels are a, uh, a very fancy built-in way to manage uh, lots of data between multiple many threads. Um, they're a massive topic to themselves, which I started to actually write a channel example, and I had it working, but I didn't want to dive that deep for uh, our talk today. Um, so here he's using a channel. Um, and you can kind of see a lot of the magic. Uh, where is it? Looking for other core routine things that are happening in here. Anyway, the whole point is, in, in probably you know two or three small files, he's reproduced most of RxJava with nothing but core routines to back it all up. So pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you have a chance and you, you want to read for entertainment, don't use this in production. He even says, I think, right on the front page here. Um, yeah. Where is it? Should I use this? It's <laughs> 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 great. It's great. Uh, yeah, Reagent is fun. You, you should check it out, like I said, mostly to see how you would write an Arch Java if you wanted to build on top of coroutines. Um, I, I think it's great that he did that, just so people have a reference point to learn how to build things. Um, of their own, so uh, it's very cool. Any, any questions otherwise? Someone else? Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. You guys can always hit me up on uh, Twitter or email or anything if you have any questions. Also, uh, Cotton Night Minneapolis is coming up next month. Uh, I actually have a date here somewhere. Um, you know, January. January sixteenth. That sounds right. It's a, a Tuesday or Wednesday. For Come on. On the right, upcoming. Upcoming on the right. There it is. January 16th at 6 p.m. is uh, when, we, when the food will be there, I think. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, no. We're, we're having three speakers, so we, I think we'll have like a, a brief period for people to settle in. But uh, we've got some great speakers. I know uh, Steve Peterson speaking. Uh, we have Edgar Provost and uh, Dan Liu will all be talking about Kotlin and BuzzFeed uh, next month. So come and check it out. It'll be a lot of fun. They have beer. And they have beer. Uh, uh, Steve works there, of course, so he knows. Uh -huh. it's, it's good beer. <laughs> well, Colin, thank you very much. Uh, we have a, a thank you for very cool. coming out tonight and giving me a talk. Um, Stay tuned for more, more fun things. Uh, we kind of got a little, later bit of a start. There's probably more pizza. Go have some pizza. But uh, let's shoot for getting out of here not much later than maybe 20 after, because uh, our, our hosts have been kind enough to stay this late and that they have families and lives. So thanks again, everybody. See you next week.